Hi, you're watching NME, and we're here with Death Cab for Cutie. How are you doing, guys? Good, how are you? Great. Yeah, pretty good. A little bit shaky. Didn't get much sleep, but it must be the same for you guys. You guys have been on the road for, well, a week now? Yeah, we're, we've been over, I've been over here for about a week in this, this general time zone, so things are starting to level out. But, um, yeah, you know, you get sleep where you can get it. Yeah. Um, and you're in town for Meltdown with Robert Smith. Yes. yes. That must be quite a head fuck. <laughs> To know that Robert Smith handpicked you, you know. No, it's the ultimate head fuck. I mean, honestly, I, you know, I, I, you know, when we got the invite for it, um, we were kind of desperately trying to make it work uh, in the schedule because, I mean, we we are all enormous Cure fans, but I, I think that the Cure, I still I still love the Cure more than almost any other band, and they but they were really truly like the first band that I I really loved and felt was mine you know at a pivotal time in my life when I was 13 14 years old and you know back in the back in the early 90s you know uh, <laughs> you know it was we were much living in a shitty suburban town you're much more isolated from culture than than kids are today so uh, discovering that finding that and making that my own um, meant the world to me so to have to be like living in you know in a world where Robert Smith asks us to play a music festival is, is, is huge for us. Is and the man writes a lovely email. I heard he writes emails in all caps lock. Is that true? It's true. <laughs> so that's, yeah, at least, at least to us he does. Maybe yeah. he's just yelling at us. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> See, how would you describe his, his... Is his influence remained throughout the history of Death Cab or is it always in your mind? Oh, absolutely. For sure. I mean, we, we referenced them multiple times while making this record. Not like, what Cure song can we rip off? But, you know, what, what would the Cure do? How would they get out of this puzzle that we're in right now? Mm. And to, to me, to this day, Disintegration is a masterclass in musical arrangement. I mean, there are moments <clears> in that record, in you know, a song like Lullaby, for example, where there are literally five melodies all floating through each other at the same time. And it doesn't seem like it would be possible to have that occur and that your ear picks out each one, you know, as they go by. And um, it, it's, it's been a point of reference for me my entire career from a musical arrangement sta uh, standpoint, not to mention a songwriting standpoint. And another act that were due to play Meltdown were um, Frightened Rabbit. Yeah. And um, I knew him and would love Frightened Rabbit. And I saw, I, one of the first times I saw them was supporting you guys in like 07 or something. And I saw you did a really, yeah. really nice tribute to Scott. I was just um, wondering what you could say about him that set him apart as an artist and a songwriter. Well, I mean, you know, I, you know, I, it's, as you can imagine, it's, it's difficult to talk about. However, I, I will say that, you know, as, as, as one gets older, like I'm 41 now, as one gets older, you, I, I find myself having those moments, those epiphany moments with a band, uh, th those, happen those moments are fewer and far between. And not because there aren't, the musical landscape is different now, but just at my age, I've just heard a lot more music than somebody who's 20 years old. And, you know, things come around in cycles. You know, you, you, I'm less blown away by, uh, less frequently than I once was. And, um, you know, I, the Midnight Organ fight kind of came into my sh sphere at a pivotal time for me when I was going through like a difficult time in my life and it, you know I felt I felt a similar I felt similarly about that record and that band that I did about The Cure when I first heard The Cure that same feeling of like where did this band come from this is you know, everything about this songwriting and, and the way these songs were arranged and produced like this this it, ge it gave me that same a similar lift that I've only felt you know five to ten times in the past ten years. Um, it just doesn't happen as, as often. So, you know, we, you know, we kind of reached out to them and wanted to see if they would play some shows with us and we immediately became really good friends and, and we did two tours together and, you know, we, we, we just really, we really loved Scott and, and he, he, you know, for everything that he was going through, he was always a really lovely, positive, funny, self-effacing, wonderful human being. And so, you know, you know, the news was very shocking to me as someone who, you know, we, we, you know, we would share emails and, and talk, you know, every couple months, but it wasn't as if, you know, we were 
each other's you know uh, you know greatest confidants. So you know you know I we've we've lost a giant. I mean he you know he was such an amazing writer and such an amazing human being and um, and you know you know there there is very little silver lining when somebody passes away. But I think it's been really wonderful to see in the tributes to him you know how much wider his music and their music had gone than I ever really known. You know, that people kind of, as the tributes pour in, you realize, you know, while this, this music was as important to these people as it was to me. And you said something there about um, very rarely and seldom being struck by mm-hmm. a new singer songwriter. So just wondering, when you approach a record, do you listen to much contemporary music? Because none of your records feel like they're of a specific time, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'm out there fighting the good fight, trying to discover things all the time, for sure. And but like Ben, it is it is harder and harder to find those things that really seem to fundamentally speak to you or to me. But they they still happen. Yeah, I guess I guess I guess the difference for us, for me now, as opposed to the first couple albums that we made, is that I feel like we have settled into uh, our identity as a band. I think. Certainly, on this new record, I feel this record has more in common uh, tonally and lyrically to maybe kind of, you know, like the second through the fifth record than it necessarily <coughs> does the last couple albums. I, um, but at the same time, I, you know, I, you know, I there are innumerable, ban- innumerable bands that are active right now that I absolutely love. You know, I love Chastity Belt, Charlie Bliss. You know, I love all, Always. I think Always are phenomenal. Um, you say it's always. I'm always, saying always. Yeah. It's always. Yeah, you know, it's they're right. they're making themselves Googleable. <laughs> yeah, you know, like like Traverches. Traverches. Yeah. Are, yeah. <laughs> who we also love. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, so I mean, I, you know, just because music doesn't, new music doesn't knock me over with the same frequency as as it once did when I was in my early twenties, I I still find myself listening to a lot of it and, and finding a lot to take, you know, in, as far as inspiration from what younger people are making. I, mean, I love the mo- most recent Young Fathers record a lot. I think it's just so good. unbelievably innovative and interesting. Yeah, there was a study making the rounds recently on, on, the, on the internets about uh, there was like a, a biochemical reason for why yeah. we, uh, you probably saw this thing. There's the one that says you, just stop, just, you stop discovering new music when you hit 30 apparently. At 30, yeah, <laughs> was it 30? Because yeah, yeah I'm, I, I'm hoping to break the trend, but I do, I, I believe it, absolutely. Yeah. People just see, I, growing up I would make fun of my dad because like the last record that he would talk about was Blood on the Tracks by Bob Dylan, which came out in 1975 when he was in his mid-30s, you know, and now I'm like, ah, of course, you know. And so, so in what way would you say that um, Thank You For Today is a departure from Kintsugi? Well, I think the most obvious, the most obvious kind of departure um, was the departure of Chris Walla leaving the band. Um, you know, I mean, and when, when he left the band, um, it was very bittersweet. There was something that we kind of knew was coming for some time. And, uh, you know, we'd, we'd, all, we'd gotten close to that kind of fissure a couple times that, you know, we kind of kept things together. And eventually just, we kind of, it, it was, we just kind of realized, and Chris realized, I should say, that he, I think he'd kind of put his time in, you know. And obviously we're very grateful for all that time. Uh, but, you know, in, in bringing Dave and Zach into the band, you know, it's it's really kind of revitalized me as a songwriter, and um, it, it, the you know the energy of having new people in the band, and and most importantly, like new musical skill sets to pull from, um, has has been just really really enjoyable. And um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that we have a lot in common with them musically, but like. You know, I think that when you, you know, I think that there are moments in relatively recent music history where you see people, seminal members leave bands and have new people join and have something really exciting happen. I mean, Wilco comes to mind as, you know, I think the most uh, obvious example of that where, you know, Jay Bennett leaves Wilco. People wonder if what the band's going to be and if they're going to continue. And then, you know, now we're, we're, here, we're here now, what, 15 years later and you know, in that time, Wilco's made, in my argument, my 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 argument, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, you know, some of their greatest records since then. That you know, you know, one would hope would sit alongside Yankee Hotel Foxtrot or being there, or whatever it might be. So their kind of transition has been really ins- inspirational for us, and 
in, in, ha in where we are now and where we're going from this point on. It's not going to be like Kiss where in 15 years' time it's just Nick left on his own, <laughs> I, that, you know, as much merch as he can. You know, that being said, there, there <clears throat> is no band without Nick, though. He, he is even, I think even more so than I, like, he need, if he's not there, it's not Death Cab for Cutie. Uh, I don't know, man. The, the Dave and Zach play the songs of Death Cab for Cutie tour of 2035. <laughs> it's going to be hot. So Very just, hot, uh, yeah. I've, I've already engineered a, uh, a hostile takeover of the... The copyrights, everything. So, just so you know. Yeah, we, we, we forget, we're getting sniffs about your legal team. We're kind of coming around, kind of trying to find inroads. Lunch boxes, themed restaurants. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. all in the works. <laughs> I've got a brilliant guy. I mean, what was it like stepping into this process? I mean, did you, was it, did you feel the pressure of joining, like, an indie institution? Or? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I felt like the, the, the sky was crashing in on me at first. But, um, you know, I, happily, I was good friends with these guys. I was friends with Chris. I have loved, I'm a Death Cab for Cutie fan. I've loved this band since the first record. So their music was part of my own DNA. And it felt like sort of a weird homecoming in a way. Like we'd kind of been circling around each other in this strange way. And so uh, it, it was a nice way to come into the band because there was this album that had been made of new songs, but Chris wasn't going to be supporting it. So I got to learn all these cool new Death Cab for Cutie songs that I liked. But I wasn't like immediately like, Death Cab replaces Chris Walla and go make an album and here I am in all of the photos and everything like that. It was, it was a nice buffer of joining the band as like a, a hired kind of, kind of guy to play these Kintsugi songs along with Zach mm -hmm. and, and getting a few years to kind of really get in the, in the zone with these guys. And then, which has led us to this point today of being a full band member and, and making this record that I love. So. so no hate mail from hardcore Chris fans yet? <laughs> Not too much. <laughs> fans, fans, but I was, I was expecting the worst, absolutely. Because, um, yeah, Chris is a, an integral part of this band's history. And I would hate for anyone to think that I'm just coming in and disrespecting anything he did. I love what he contributed to this band. And he's a brilliant guy that came up with amazing guitar parts that I love playing. Um, and still, to this day, yeah, there's a few comments here and there that are just like, bring Chris back, you know, that kind of stuff. And... I get it. I totally get it. But by and large, I'd say like 90% of people have been really lovely and welcoming, and I couldn't be happier. When we all, and I think it's also important to note that we're first and foremost music fans, and you know we have our own opinions about you know shifting lineups and bands that we love as well. So like we totally get it. You yeah. Know? But I think that you know if there's one point that I've really been trying to get across <clears throat> throughout you know you know this process of talking about the new record and the new lineup is like. You know, we you know, we were never trying to replace Chris. Like Chris was an irreplaceable part of this band's history and story. You know, so we were never we were never going to kind of start talking about you know the new record and be and and be you know kind of speaking ill of him or trying to undermine his legacy. Like you know, he is responsible and his his, his production is particularly is responsible for you know will go down as you know if not the most, like some of the most seminal albums that we've made. I mean, at this point, we made eight albums with Chris and we've made one album with, you know, Dave and Zach. So, um, you know, you know we, we never saw it as like we we're replacing Chris Walla. We saw it as like, let's become something new. Let's, you know, we have this catalog of material. You know, I have this batch of songs. You know, for me, as, as the band leader and songwriter, I started, I started to really kind of listen back to a lot of the old records and 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 in playing these songs live, realize like what what is it about this band that people like? Why are people connected to these songs? Why do they like the songs they like, and why are they connected to us? And more times than not, it was the same songs that people loved uh, the most in the audience that were songs that I loved the most playing. So when I was writing songs for this record, I really wanted to kind of tap into that spirit of like, what, what have I not been doing that people want me to do? And by proxy I want myself to do. Oh, well, I want to play more guitar. I want the guitars to do more of this. I want the lyrics to speak to this subject matter. Like, I want to kind of <clears throat> try to get us, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to make transatlanticism again. I don't want to make We Have the Facts again. But I want to tap into the spirit of what makes the songs on those records Death Cab for Cutie songs. And, and, and you know, I, I feel that in, in, the, in, the, in the peak moments in, this, in, in Thank You for Today, I feel that some of those songs feel much more uh, akin to some of the material in some of those earlier records that people, you know, recognize us by than, you know, the band we were two albums ago. Yeah. But aside from that commonality, I mean, you guys have never, re you've never made the same album twice. 
So how would you describe the, the character and the themes of this record that set it apart? Well, I think, you know, as I have kind of, you know, as, I, as I've gotten older and, you know, a lot of the subjects that I've always written about are still really inter interesting to me. I mean, I'm still fascinated by, um, you know, how, how, how <coughs> human beings are connected or fall out of connection. And, and, the, and just personal relationships, the small moments between two people uh, that either create a chasm or connect them even further. Um, so in some ways, I'm, I've, I'm always kind of delving into that. That's a well that I'm going to often because I'm still very fascinated by it. But now it's being filtered through a lens of being, you know, you know a middle-aged man. And, you know, look at, at being at a point in my life now where if I'm lucky, I'm at the middle point of my life. And, you know, when I was 20, when I was 23, I was looking forward a lot more because there was so much more in front of me at the time than there was behind me, you know. But now, I'm, I'm, if I'm, like, as I said, if I'm lucky, I'm equidistant between the beginning and the end. I'm at the point of no return. So being at the point of no return means that, um, you know, you cannot, you cannot kind of double back on a, on to a decision you made and then go down another <coughs> path. It's like, this is the path that I'm on. Professionally, obviously, I'm very happy about that. But in my personal life and in my familial life and with my friends and the city I live in and everything else, it's like, you know, it's a point of great reflection for me as to how I got to where I am in my life and, um, and where, where I'm going from this point on if, as, if I am at the halfway point. Um, and, you know, that's, that has become, certainly for this record, like a, a fairly kind of, you know, deep source of inspiration because, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, everybody has regrets, you know? I, mean, I, I hate when people say, like, they don't have regrets. Like, of course they do. Everyone regrets things that they said or did. Um, but I think that this record has a lot to do with kind of trying to be in, a, in the moment and while also kind of reflecting, while looking forward and backwards at the same time. You mentioned it earlier, I mean, you guys made a um, million dollar loan for, what was it called, 30 songs? 30 songs in 30 days, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so is that your way of kind of exercising the sort of anti-Trump political demons about this horrible dystopian nightmare we're living in? Yeah. Well, there, was, there was like a, a clear and present need for that song at the time that seems less now. Like the election was about to happen. We were trying to change the course of what happened and it didn't work out. And I don't, I don't think we have a lot to say about it in song right now, at least. You know? Yeah, I, I've, I've noticed, you know, it's, we're sitting here talking in June of 2018 and I've noticed, you know, this is now a year and a half or whatever after the election in the States. So this is about the time that people's albums are coming out that are the culmination of songs written about um, this dystopian nightmare that we're living in, uh, some, in some ways, in some ways around the world, but specifically in the United States. And um, I'm finding that a lot of these albums are very poorly written because, um, you know, if Bruce Springsteen or Ted Leo, you know, wants to write about the state of American politics, there's an authority and a track record there and an experience writing those types of songs. And it's not to say that if one chooses to write a political song having never written one before, that that's a waste of their time, or that they're not earnest about it. It's like, it's not saying that at all. But however, um, I feel like, you know, the musical landscape has become flooded with people writing songs about subject matter, it, this particular subject matter, and a lot of it's poorly written. And also, dude, we get it. We, we get it. Like, if you're listening to a band like Death Cab for Cutie in 2018, you know, I would pres it presupposes you have, like, you're not necessarily that you're liberal, but you have certain sensitivities <laughs> that might, you know, you might be a certain, politically leaning a certain way, or at least understand or know that we lean that way politically. I guess that's a better way of putting it. Obviously, you don't have to, it doesn't, we don't care if you're, you know, right leaning, left leaning, it doesn't matter, it, you know insofar as you find a connection to this music and it plays in your life. But you'd have to be really living under a rock to not know what our politics are in 2018. So I found it to be completely unnecessary for us to kind of delve into that kind of subject matter for a whole album or the majority of an album. And also, like, I'm <coughs> terrible at writing those kind of songs. I'm just not good at them. I, you know, in, in the... In the 
wake of the election and the lead up and everything, you know, I, in the songs I was writing that became this record, there were a couple of tunes that kind of dealt with this stuff kind of esoterically. And I realized even after writing that material that this is just not my strong suit. And not necessarily, and I'm not necessarily writing songs for what, for the audience. Um, you know, I'm writing them for my own, uh, my own kind of uh, satisfaction. And I believe that if I'm, if I'm satisfied and enjoy something I wrote, that most likely the people that like this band might, some of them might feel the same way. Um, but I just, I just, I just don't, I'm just not good at that kind of songwriting. And I, for, for this band, we would much rather be politically active um, in, in, you know, the causes that we kind of support, in the benefit shows we play, uh, in, you know, when we're asked pointed questions about how we feel about the state of the world, the country, we will answer them honestly. But it just doesn't, it didn't feel necessary to write an album about what's going on in the world. And, so, and final point, I think we also realized, and I felt this way in writing, the, in writing the record, that I just wanted to give people a break from this. Mm. You know, I mean, it's like we, we just cannot get away from this fucking guy. We cannot get away from him. And, you know, I wanted to make a record that let people go inwards and kind of, and, and kind of, and not think about this stuff for 40 minutes. You know, it's okay. You don't have to think about this all the time. You know, we're, we're, we are so overwhelmed with, with Trumpism. You know, we cannot get away from this guy, whether you like him or not. And, you know, and if you take your eye off it for, for five minutes or for 40 minutes to listen to an album or an hour and a half to watch a movie, you know, that's okay. You know, we, we need to give ourselves a break from this stuff. It's okay. Amen. Yeah. Death Gap for Cutie. Thank you so much for your time. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Great to be here. Cheers.